Hi guys, welcome to today's video on diabetes and glucose management for first semester nursing students. I do a traditional lecture style of video, so it's not fast and entertaining, but it's thorough. And I do this because nursing programs have moved into a concept-based curriculum, and oftentimes the lecture portion has been taken out of that class. So I like to make the lectures so that if the students do learn best that way, they can have that option to have that content. So uh, as you can see, my, my dog has to be here with us today for some reason. So here she is. And we're going to jump into this video. And I just want to let you know that uh, I am going to introduce the concepts of diabetes and the different types and how we manage it, manage it. But you're going to learn more about this as the semesters continue. So, okay, let's start. Ah, yes. Okay. That is what I want. Let's start this lecture off by a little activity. I want you all to type in the comment section what comes to mind when you hear the term diabetes. So go ahead and plug that in below. This activity will basically allow me to see what first semester students know or what they think about diabetes when they first hear the word. And then we're going to talk about so many other things that have to do with diabetes. In this video, we are going to talk about diabetes, the signs and symptoms of diabetes, things that patients need to watch for, the knowledge gap that our patients face when diagnosed with diabetes and having to manage that chronic lifelong condition, preventing diabetes and complications, and proper ways to manage this. So I get a lot of my slides from a royalty-free Adobe platform so that I can post them on YouTube. And so a lot of times they're in, you know, layman's terms, but that's okay because then we'll kind of go through it and it'll help you with your health literacy and how you can talk to your patients because we need to know the medical terminology, but we also need to know how we can relay that medical terminology to patient populations. Okay, so diabetes. General symptoms would be excessive urine, which is called polyuria, infection, thirst, which is called polydipsia, fatigue, which means you're tired, hungry, which is polyphagia, and vision changes. And then the complications that occur are all of these things on this slide, coronary heart disease, nephropathy, neuropathy, try saying that six times fast. Stroke or CVA, cerebral vascular accident, retinopathy, so your eyes, and peripheral vascular disease and problems. So that's decreased circulation and perfusion down in the lower extremities. Here's just another slide with the same information on it. Um, our patients will have peripheral neuropathy. And I know I'm kind of like starting at the end, but I guess this is sort of attention grabbing to see that diabetes causes so many things. So if we can manage our diabetes or prevent diabetes, we are in good shape. Um, permanent kidney damage, diabetic foot infections, blindness, glaucoma, many complications with diabetes. So how can we prevent it? Well, we can't always prevent diabetes. Let's just say that right up front. But if it is a preventable form of diabetes, then, and we will talk about the different types in just a moment, but we can lower our weight, undergo regular checkups so that the patients can see their trending lab values, reduce salt consumption, reduce stressors. Reducing stressors can help with blood sugar management because having increased stress releases catecholamines and the stress hormones, which then raise your blood sugar. So that's a whole circle there. Um, we want to increase our activity level, reduce our blood pressure, eat more fiber, and limit sugar intake. So remember, this is a slide that is for the general population. So it's simple in layman's terms, but we're going to start there and we will dive deeper as we move on. 
So the incidence of diabetes in 2023, according to the CDC, 38.4 million people have diabetes mellitus. That's 11.6% of our population. 97.6 million people are pre-diabetic. You will learn all about what pre-diabetes means in just a minute here. So 27.2 million people are 65 years and older. So what does this say to us? This says that our patients that we're going to take care of have diabetes. So it's very important for us to know how to manage diabetes, how to take care of our patients, and all of the different medications. Now, I'm not going to get into the medications in this video, but I could make a video on that if you wanted me to. I know that you will learn that in your pharmacology class, but if you're like, oh, I just love listening to Dr. Jamie talk, I will make a video on the meds. Physiology. Let's talk about the cells that are involved in diabetes and blood glucose regulation. They are in the pancreas, okay? Our pancreas is the organ that we worry about when we have diabetes. So there is alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. Let's talk for a minute about the alpha cells. Alpha cells secrete glucagon when blood glucose levels drop, typically below 70. So this would happen like between meals or when you're working out or having, you know, exercise. Glucagon primarily simulates the liver, but it can also work in the kidneys to convert amino acids into glucose, which glucose is our sugar molecule. And glucagon stimulates the liver and adipose tissue to break down lipids and release fatty acids into the circulation to produce glucose. As glucose levels rise, the release of glucagon by the alpha cells is stopped. Then we have beta cells. So beta cells are the cells that release insulin into the bloodstream once blood glucose levels start to rise. So after a meal, you know, and so when we eat a meal, our blood sugar rises, but our blood sugar, now the glucose needs to get into the cells and insulin is basically the key that opens the cells that lets the sugar, the glucose go into the cells. So we have to have beta cells to release insulin to manage our blood sugar. These cells are called the islets of Langerhans, which is a doctor who discovered them. And there's two actions. Insulin released within minutes after you start eating. It peaks in like 30 to 60 minutes and falls back to the basal level within two to three hours. This is important to know when we do like our glucose tolerance test, fasting blood sugar, those, um, those factors play a part in the results of those tests. Insulin also stimulates the conversion of glucose into glycogen in the liver and the muscles for later use and facilitates lipid and protein synthesis. The beta cells in the pancreas, very, very important. They automatically make, store, and release insulin as needed to keep our blood sugar levels in the normal range, which depending on what hospital you're looking at or lab values you're looking at, that's usually between 60 to 90, 60 to 100, 70 to 100, somewhere in that range. So there's two mechanisms of action. One is our basal rate. That is a level of insulin that's secreted throughout the day and night that keeps us at a steady level of blood glucose. Then there's also prandial release of insulin, which is known as like a bolus dose that our pancreas gives us when we eat. And this helps so that all the glucose can go into the cells, be utilized for energy, and our blood sugar level goes back to sort of the baseline level. There's delta cells in the pancreas, which releases the somostatin, and this stops all the release of the pancreatic hormones, including insulin. So this is the breaks on, okay, we have enough insulin circulating in our bloodstream. We can stop producing it now. So homeostasis, 
How does our body keep everything within that 60 to 90 range? This is actually really amazing that our body can do this. Our blood glucoses fluctuate throughout the day. We want to maintain that 60 to 90, and it's kept in range by our pancreas, by our pancreas releasing insulin to bring our blood sugar down and releasing glucagon to bring our blood sugar back up. Diabetics have pancreases, don't release enough insulin, or their cells just aren't receptive to the insulin. So they struggle to keep within this normal range. So in the beginning of this video, if I didn't mention it, I have been diabetic since I was about 21. And so I have a blood glucose meter at home and I check my blood sugar and I can eat something and 30 minutes later or an hour later, my blood sugar will be 200, 240 milligrams per deciliter. And my husband will eat the same thing, check his blood sugar and it's back down to 70. So he really does have a much more efficient pancreas than I do. So how it works. Okay, so this is a great little picture. Let's take a second to really look at this picture. So these are our cells, the white or the big round balls are our cells. And then you can see that there's an insulin receptor and a glucose channel. So the glucose channel is going to open up when the insulin fits into that insulin receptor. And then all of the floating glucose can go into the cell, taking it out of our blood sugar or out of our bloodstream, lowering our blood sugar, and then utilizing it for energy in our cells. So when you hear diabetes lectures from other instructors, you'll hear the term chemical key most likely. So insulin is the chemical key that unlocks the cell to allow the glucose to enter the cell. According to the American Diabetes Association, non-diabetic people run within that blood glucose range of about 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. Normal fasting blood sugar is usually around 80 to 90. So fasting means that you've just woken up or you haven't eaten you know, for eight hours and then your blood sugar is about 80 to 90. A normal postprandial blood glucose level, which is two hours after you eat, should be between 120 and 140. And the blood, the, the ideal blood sugar for a diabetic patient who is very well controlled is 80 to 120. Hormone influence on our blood glucose levels is very significant when we're talking about patient care because stress hormones such as epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, corticosteroids, growth hormones, they actually inhibit the release of insulin because they, they are designed to give us that boost of additional energy when we need it in a fight or flight situation. But when you're chronically just stressed or you're hospitalized and your body is under stress and you are under stress, then it's a long sort of long-term raise in the blood sugar, which isn't good for healing and, and for our bodies in general. Uh, according to the American Diabetes Association, hospitalized parent patients or critically ill patients have a different parameter range for blood glucose. Typically, patients in the ICU who are hospitalized, the goal is to keep their blood sugar between 140 and 180. This is for all ICU patients, not even ICU patients who have diabetes because of the stress hormones. Okay, let's talk about diabetes then. Diabetes mellitus. Okay, so it's a chronic condition. Chronic means long-term. It involves multiple systems. So it is a complication of insulin production and or insulin utilization. So either your patient isn't producing enough insulin or no insulin in some cases, or they are producing insulin or they are producing insulin, but their cells are unable or the cells are less responsive to the insulin. So the keys aren't working. And sometimes you have a combination of that too, less insulin, higher resistance of the cells accepting the insulin. And so it's characterized by hyperglycemia, abnormal metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. 
Classifications of diabetes. Okay, let's see. So let's talk about all of these. I have a lot of notes that I will be adding in, but I can pretty much talk to these off the top of my head. So let's try that. So prediabetes is when you have a patient who has trending labs of an elevated blood glucose level out of the normal range of a non-diabetic person. So those labs will be a fasting blood sugar of 126 or higher, or a hemoglobin A1C of 6.4. I hope I don't have to correct myself later because I do have slides on this. So if you're pre-diabetic, then your doctor is going to maybe, maybe put you on some oral medications, possibly. But first line would be to increase exercise, have dietary modifications, and weight loss. And that might help the body be able to regulate the blood glucose levels, you know, more efficiently and get you out of that pre-diabetic state. Type 1 diabetes is, used to be known as juvenile diabetes because it happens in the younger population. So our patient's typical age of onset of diabetes would be around 10 to 13, those, that age group, but it can happen, you know, younger than that. And that is when the pancreas just has um, has had almost like an autoimmune inflammatory infection or a injury and the beta cells are damaged and no longer produce insulin. And then there's type two diabetes, which is when your pancreas either doesn't secrete enough insulin or your cells are resistant to the insulin that is secreted or a combination of both and you have high blood sugar because of that. Then there's gestational diabetes, which is diabetes in pregnant women. And it is any degree of glucose intolerance with the onset of recognizing pregnancy. There's secondary diabetes, which is a diabetes that is caused by a treatment of some sort. There is latent autoimmune, autoimmune diabetes of adults, which is when adults' pancreases have that autoimmune injury and now their beta cells are damaged and they become a type 1 diabetic, but it's later in life. And then there's Modi diabetes, which is mature onset diabetes of the young. And that's what I have. Um, and that is when you are diagnosed with a type two diabetes, but it's before the age of typical type two diabetics, or you don't have the factors that often lead to type two diabetes. That was me. I was diagnosed with that when I was 21. So I'm kind of a visual person. I really do like pictures and I myself have to ponder the pictures for quite some time. So if you're like that, you know, pause the video and really look at this picture. But look over here, we have healthy glucose transportation. So there's our pancreas, it's secreting all that insulin. And the insulin is going into that insulin receptor. So the key is opening up the lock, and the glucose is able to transport into the glucose Wait, where's my glasses? I can't read that word. Well, the glucose receptor on this picture, it says transporter. And so you can see in diabetes type one, the pancreas doesn't make any insulin. So the glucose is just floating around in the bloodstream with no way of getting into the cell. This is very interesting because some of the signs of type one diabetes is extreme hunger but also with extreme weight loss. And so it's because, yes, the patient is eating, but their blood sugar is just staying in the blood and it's not feeding the cells. So they're becoming emaciated because of that. They also then have to do anaerobic metabolism that releases acid into the bloodstream and they become acidotic. So that is oftentimes how a diabetic with type one will first discover that they are diabetic is because they go into diabetic ketoacidosis, but more on that later. Then we have type two diabetes where our pancreas secretes insulin, but the glucose receptor just is closed, not receptive 
insulin receptor is blocked, as you can see here. So the key doesn't fit in the lock and the glucose just circulates around. Now, the reason why a diabetic with type 1 diabetes will go into DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis is because the, none of their cells are getting the glucose because they don't make any insulin. But in diabetic diabetes type 2, the patients make insulin and some of the cells will be receptive to it. So they're getting enough blood sugar that they're not producing ketones. And so our diabetics with type 2 diabetes will get what's known as hyperosmolar hyperglycemia non-ketotic syndrome, which can actually be a little bit um, more dangerous for our patients because it's harder to recognize. Again, this is intro to diabetes. Sorry, I go on tangents. We might learn more about that later and you'll definitely learn more about that in second semester. Okay, so here is another picture, produces insulin when it's healthy. Type 1 diabetes, it gets an injury, it gets an inflammatory process, it's an autoimmune disorder, um, it doesn't produce insulin, so blood glucose just stays floating around in the blood. And these patients with type 1 diabetes have to have exogenous insulin. I hope I'm pronouncing that right because I'm terrible with pronunciation, but insulin from an outside source, so they have to actually take insulin, which is an injection when they have type one diabetes, no other option have to be on insulin. So type one diabetes, greatest insulin in people under 30 years old, but really it's even younger for the most part, 11 to 13 years of age, which is, which is actually crazy if you think about that, because here we are at the peak age of adolescence, when all of a sudden our patients are diagnosed with a completely life-altering disease process, huge learning curve, changes pretty much every aspect of their life at that age. I mean, how rough is that? So be sensitive to that when you take care of these people. Um, the incidence is approximately 5% to 10% of cases. It's an autoimmune disease process triggered by the pancreatic B cell inflammation autoimmune antibodies impair B cell function. So in layman's term, it damages our B cells and they no longer secrete insulin. And so my, my daughter is a type one diabetic and she was diagnosed when she was four and it was right after she had the flu. And the doctor was telling me that because she had the flu, it triggered that inflammatory response and it damaged her pancreas. We have a strong, strong diabetic gene in my family. I think everyone on my dad's side, everyone has either prediabetes or diabetes, type one, type two, we've got it all. So signs and symptoms of type one diabetes. So polyuria, polydipsia, increased thirst, polyphagia, increased hunger. So remember we were talking about the patho of type one diabetes the cells are not getting the nutrients that they need. So although we're very, very hungry and eating, the patients are losing, losing weight. And they're very tired because they're not getting any energy. They have frequent infections. It's a very rapid onset. We'll talk about type 2 diabetes in a minute here, but type 2 diabetes can go on unrecognized for years and years if, you're, if your patients haven't been going and getting their annual blood work done. But a type 1 diabetic can't be type 1 without knowing about it for very long because of the starvation of the cells and the um, acid production leading them to diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, so when I have taken care of patients who have type 1 diabetes in the ER, I have had patients brought in by their family members mom is just beside herself. She, you know, one time she took me aside and was so worried that her daughter had an eating disorder because she was losing so much weight so rapidly. She, the little girl, I think she was, you know, in her teens, 11 to 13. She just looked absolutely awful in the bed. And sure enough, her blood sugar was, you know, 600 or something way off the charts. And hence, diabetes was discovered. These patients, when they're newly onset, they go to the, to the ICU and they have to be on insulin drips and have all kinds of education. And it's a, it's a very, very disruptive process 
to the patient and the family. Very scary, very stressful. Type 1 diabetes patients have a risk for developing DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, this is the most fascinating topic. I never know how to say these things right without sounding weird, but we are all nurses and nursing students going into nursing. So I'll just say what I want to say, which is treating a type one diabetic in DKA is a very, is a very big adrenaline rush. It takes a lot to get these patients healthy and stabilized and they come in so sick. So they're Blood glucose is greater than 300 in a type 1 diabetic. Remember that. Remember that because it differentiates it from hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non ketotic syndrome. It's different. Okay. So their blood sugar is above 300. Um, they, they don't have any insulin and maybe they haven't been taking their insulin. So not only could this be happening as a new onset diabetic, but also if a current insulin dependent diabetic is sick or lost their supplies, you know, other things can cause this DKA. Um, it results in metabolic acidosis. It creates a life-threatening emergency. So it takes all hands on deck to get these patients stabilized and they have to go to the ICU. So I'm so sorry, I'm not going to continue on this subject because you will learn about it in second semester and then also in ICU. So type two diabetes we have the release of insulin, but maybe less. And then we also have our cells not being receptive to the insulin. So it's really this complicated disease to treat because of all of these factors. So our patients eat food, they make their insulin, but the cells don't want to take the insulin. And since the cells aren't taking in the glucose that's circulating around in the bloodstream, it's storing it now at your body is storing the glucose as fat now. So then they're feeling tired and hungry and the cycle continues. They just eat more. They're not getting the nutrients that they need. It's not getting transported into the cells and they're storing it as fat again. So you can see how this is like a big cycle. What, who would want to exercise when they're just feeling so tired and lethargic, yet they just keep gaining, gaining weight and not getting the nutrients. It's terrible. So we're going to talk about type two diabetes here for a minute. Um, so heredity can be a factor. The onset is usually over 40, which is why then people who are diagnosed with a type two diabetes presentation, but they're younger than 40 and they're not overweight and all of those factors are why there is that mature onset diabetes of the young that I have. 80% of type two patients are obese and they may present with minimal or no symptoms. Like I was telling you about type one diabetes. You can't ignore type one diabetes. It's gonna be very, very obvious if you have type one diabetes, right? But type two diabetes, your blood sugar just rises and rises and rises and rises and you you might not know. So type two diabetes is more associated with insulin resistance and impaired secretion of insulin. So it's that combo there. It's a gradual onset. It's not prone to diabetic ketoacidosis, but you're going to get that hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome, which is really, really dangerous. I love that subject because I really don't feel like they talk about it very much in the hospital setting, but they should. So here's the difference. Remember our type one diabetic patient with the blood sugar of 300 was in DKA and dying and had to go to the ICU. Well, type two diabetics will have blood sugars 500 to 1,000, 1,200, sometimes even higher. But they, and they are sick because when your blood sugar goes so high, water, you know, wants to flush it out. So they have polyuria, excessive urination. They're very fatigued and they're extremely dehydrated, extremely dehydrated. And their electrolytes are completely off. So they're probably hypokalemic. So low potassium. So, okay. So they may not even know they have diabetes, but they go to check in because they're just tired and they just don't feel good at all. And then all of a sudden we're like, your blood sugar is a thousand. Um, so they can also present with macro and microvascular complications. 
I think I have a slide about this, but I'll talk about it now and then I'll just cut that slide out later. But our macrovascular complications are damage to our big vessels. So like our heart, our lower extremities, and our microvascular complications are in our kidneys or our eyes, like our tiny blood vessels get damaged too. So clinical manifestations of type 2 diabetes is fatigue, reoccurring infections, prolonged wound healing or poor healing wounds, itching, blurred vision, and nonspecific minimal symptoms, you know, just general malaise, they don't feel good. Um, they're, they're just it generally unwell. And remember in the slide, a few slides ago, it said that 80% of type 2 diabetics are obese. So it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Because people with type 2 diabetes are also going to have sleep apnea. They may have those skin conditions where they have like the dark rings around their neck or skin tags. They may not be associating that with diabetes. It might be because of obesity, but what is it? Did the obesity cause the diabetes? Is the diabetes uh, making the obesity worse? You know, so people who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they have a lot of work to do and it's a big learning curve and they need a lot of support in the beginning. Gestational diabetes. So the onset for gestational diabetes is during pregnancy and approximately 4% of the women have gestational diabetes Sometimes gestational diabetes can just be managed with diet modifications and increasing their activity level. Um, and it's typically diagnosed in the second to third trimester by a glucose tolerance test that all of us women have to have. If you have had a child, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You go to the lab, they check your blood sugar, then you have to drink this big drink of sugary, sugary fluid. I think it used to be called glucola. I don't know what it's called now, but then you would have serial blood sugar checks from that point on to see if your pancreas was bringing your blood pressure or your blood sugar down into that normal range. What was it? 120 to 140 postprandial. So if it's not, and it was higher than that, then you would be deemed glucose intolerant. And um, then you could be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So, but having gestational diabetes puts you at risk for all these terrible things, cesarean delivery, fetal death, neonatal mortality and morbidity. 60% of the women who have gestational diabetes develop actual diabetes, diabetes within 15 years. Um, that is really important to know. And also once you get into OB, you'll probably learn more about this, but your babies of gestational diabetes moms will be large for um, their birth age. And secondary diabetes is an abnormal elevation of glucose levels from another treatment. So if they have Cushing syndrome or hyperthyroidism, it can affect your blood sugar. And hypothyroidism has long been known to increase um, blood sugar and cause hyperglycemia. Cushing syndrome increases the cortisol levels, which remember is one of those stress hormones um, that inhibits the production of insulin. Parental nutrition is when our patients get their parental nutrition is when our patients are getting their nutrition via IV and it is high in glucose. So it can cause that high blood sugar and then corticosteroids um, or seizure medications can raise our blood sugar too. So that could be called secondary diabetes. Hopefully it will go away once those disorders are resolved. So a normal fasting blood glucose is less than a hundred. So that means if you wake up in the morning and check your blood glucose, it should be less than a hundred in a non-diabetic person. Impaired fasting glucose would be greater than a hundred, but less than 125. So that's just impaired. And then a diagnosis of diabetes would be if your fasting blood glucose is greater than 126. And that is a funny thing about my diagnosis. I think for um, 
for about a year or two, I was 125. And then when I got to the 126, it was like, oh no, now I'm officially diabetic. And if you take a blood sugar any time of day, just a casual check your blood sugar any time of day, and it's greater than 200, then this could be a strong, strong indication of diabetes. It's not an actual diagnosis, but um, they would probably have you check your blood sugar more frequently. More on laboratory tests. So there's glucose tolerance tests that we just talked about. There's a glycolated hemoglobin A1C, which is an amazing lab that I love. There's urine and ketone levels to see if we are producing ketones, which basically means that our, I always talk like, like it's us and not our patients. <laughs> oh, well, sorry. But um, that basically means that our cells are not getting enough glucose and they're having to break down our stored fats for energy, which releases ketones. And then we have serum electro electrolytes. Potassium is a big, big factor when it comes to diabetes. And then we have point of care glucose tests. So let's see if I talk more about these on slides coming up. I do. Okay, I know this is a repeat slide, but I mean, you guys are nursing students and hearing things more than once is a good thing, right? So fasting plasma glucose, overnight fast. We take your blood sugar in the morning. You want it to be less than 126. If it's greater than 126, then that's diabetes. There's a random plasma glucose, any random plasma greater than 200 plus symptoms. So polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, fatigue, wounds, any of those symptoms is a diabetes diagnosis. I mean, you obviously have to get this from your doctor. You can't just diagnose yourself with diabetes, but yes. And then postprandial plasma glucose is when it's drawn two hours after a meal. You want to know what that is. Okay, so let's talk about hemoglobin A1C. This is really, really important to know. Hopefully your patients have this in their chart um, because then you can really see like, where are they at with their blood glucose management? That's what it's all about. Okay. So hemoglobin binds to glucose in proportion to the level in the blood and reported as a percentage. So your hemoglobin A1C will be a percent. It indicates the average level of control over the last three months. So you guys, this isn't an absolute number, but it's like, where about has our patient been in? Like what range have they been in over the last three months? Um, it's a helpful lab. It's not an end-all be-all lab. Okay. And the reason why I'm saying this is because it's an average over the last three months, which means let's say you have a patient and their blood sugar is 500 half of the day, but they drop significantly and are in the forties, some parts of the day, then their average isn't going to be totally reflective. But what a hemoglobin A1C can tell us is are they in control of their diabetes or are they not? Okay, so that is kind of where what we're looking at with the hemoglobin A1C. Pre-diabetes is 5.7 to 6.4% and diabetes is 6.5 or greater. And I do take metformin on a daily basis, but my A1C is always 6.4. Doesn't matter how I am acting, eating, running marathons, I'm always 6.4. And the key here is diabetics should keep their A1C below 7%. And anyone with diabetes will know what their A1C is. And hopefully they will be able to brag to you what their number is. Like, oh, I'm, I'm below 7%. As you see, I just told you mine. It's just a thing. It's a diabetic thing. Okay, so I like visuals, I told you, and even though this was on Adobe, royalty-free pictures, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. So our red blood cell has the hemoglobin on it, and then the glucose gets glycolated, right? Is that the word, glycolated? <laughs> Onto the hemoglobin. And so the more sugar is in the bloodstream, the more hemoglobins are going to be attached with glucose, showing us the average amount of glucose in the blood over that three months. I like this chart. You guys should have a chart like this somewhere so that you can refer back to it when you're taking care of your 
patients or even your family members, since we saw 97 million people are about to be diagnosed with diabetes. So I'm sure you know someone who's diabetic, but here's the chart. And so you can see the top number is the A1C percentage and the bottom number is then their average blood sugar over the last three months. So if my A1C is 6.4, then that means the average blood sugar that I have is 151. <laughs> uh, but I happen to know that um, I check my blood sugar enough to know that that is the average because I'm normally good. I'm normally like 120, 140, but for some reason, midday, it seems to spike up into the 200s. And so that's probably what bumps me up to that. So urine testing and ketone levels, the presence of urine protein indicates microvascular changes. Remember those teeny blood vessels in the kidneys are being damaged and letting protein seep through into the urine. It's not getting, you know, um, filtered or reabsorbed right. So albumin protein in the urine correlates with the progression of neuropathy or yes, that's right with the progression of neuropathy and kidney failure. I wrote this down somewhere in here. Protein in the urine requires further kidney function and an elevated urine albumin reflects the progression of neuropathies as well because it causes nerve damage. Ketones testing during acute illness and pregnancy for our diabetics and our diabetics on a weight loss program because we want to make sure that we don't have too many ketones in their urine. Ketones are a byproduct of fat metabolism. And when they're found in the urine, they can indicate a possibility of developing diabetic ketoacidosis. For diabetics who are trying to lose weight, if they have a normal blood glucose level, but they also do have some ketones in their urine, they're assured of losing weight, but this is something that needs to be managed under a doctor's care. So our electrolytes, when our blood sugar is in a healthy range, our electrolytes remain in a healthy range too. So let's look at these and even diabetes in general, but diabetic ketoacidosis causes severe hypokalemia, which is low potassium. First semester, you may not have to know all of this, but it's very interesting and it'll plant the seed for you to then build upon when you listen to this in another semester. But diabetic ketoacidosis causes hypokalemia. Insulin allows electrolytes and sugar into the cell, right? So it actually allows potassium to go into the cell as well. If you have a diabetic ketoacidosis patient who is now hypokalemia, has hypokalemia, so low potassium, and you give them insulin, you're going to dump their potassium even lower. So you have to give potassium with the insulin. Just remember that. They have a low to normal sodium level. But remember, if you are in DKA, you're probably urinating so frequently that your sodium level is going to be low. So you need to replenish that. They'll have a low bicarb level and they're because of their metabolic acidosis. And then they'll have an elevated BUN and creatinine because they are so dehydrated and their kidneys aren't functioning quite properly. So like I was saying, diabetic ketoacidosis, super difficult patients to take care of takes all hands on deck. Uh, so we got to be careful though, when we're treating them, we don't just give a diabetic ketoacidosis patient insulin by itself. No, no, no. And you don't want to drop their blood sugar too fast. But again, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Maybe if you want me to make a video on diabetic ketoacidosis, you can see I really want to make it, uh, then I will. So hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. So this commonly occurs in diabetics because of the treatment that they're on will cause a low blood sugar. Because it's insulin from an outside source, it's not regulated by your actual food intake and your actual body functions like it would be if the pancreas was releasing the insulin. So sometimes we get hypoglycemia. There's also oral medications that can cause hypoglycemia as well, but let's just hypoglycemia is when you have low blood sugar, but the signs of hypoglycemia are anxious, sweaty, very sweaty, pouring sweat, hungry, confused, unable to think because if you don't have blood sugar, you know, glucose floating in around in your, in your blood, your brain is not getting nutrients. So you start to get confused. Double vision, shaky, irritable, 
and very cool, clammy skin. So if you have a patient who's exhibiting any of these signs, or even if they're just acting combative, confused, irritated, check a blood sugar because you want to know what that is. Um, so their blood sugar needs to be increased immediately. So blood sugar is in the hospital, it's less than 70. If you check a blood sugar and their blood sugar is less than 70, the protocol is usually to give 15 grams of fast acting sugar, which can be either um, glucose gel or a juice. Um, they'll have that in on the units for you to give your patients if your patients are able to tolerate drinking fluids and aren't NPO, but low blood sugar does need to be corrected. And then blood sugars need to be rechecked within 30 minutes after you've treated it. Hyperglycemia is high blood sugar. So this will cause things like nausea and vomiting, increasing of urination, which is our polyuria, fatigue, blurred vision, excessive thirst, polydipsia, fruity breath. Oh, so this is interesting, actually. I have been a nurse for so many years and I've taken care of so many uh, diabetic ketoacidosis patients and I've never actually smelled the fruity breath. You'll read in the text that fruity breath kind of smells like, um, like a juicy fruit type of gum smell or even a nail polish smell, acetone. And, but I had never smelled it. And um, I went, I had a patient once who was brought into the ER thinking that she was intoxicated with high levels of ETOH, alcohol, uh, yet, and she smelled very intoxicated, very like, uh, like she'd been drinking and, but her blood alcohol level was zero, but her blood sugar was, um, like 500 or 600. And she wasn't, she didn't know she was diabetic. We'll put it that way. She didn't know she was diabetic. So I was like, that's the fruity breath. I finally smelled it. Okay, so let's talk about checking your patient's blood sugar. Now, in our lab class, we're going to watch a video on the meter that we use in the hospital so that you guys can see that because here's a little something about checking a blood sugar once you're a nurse. Every facility that you go to is going to have different blood sugar monitors. They're going to have different lancets. I actually have mine. And I am going to show you the little components, but don't get hung up on this because oh, oh, I have my blur on. So, okay. Don't get hung up on this because they're going to look different in the hospital, but I'll go through these steps with you. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. So if you need to check your patient's blood sugar, you first of all need to check the controls or that they've been done, usually on the floors of the hospital those tasks will be done by like the night shift nurse, just because it's a little slower pace on night shift than it is on day shift. But you want to make sure because the last thing you want to do is get all of your equipment, go into the patient's room and have the machine say control needs to be done. Ah, that is, that is really not okay. So check it, just make sure that it's been done. Introduce yourself to the patient and explain the procedure. Apply clean gloves. We're going to read through these steps and then I'm going to show you how I do it. Apply clean gloves. Puncture the patient's fingertip with the lancet, preferably on the side of the fingertip rather than the pad of the fingertip. Um, okay, that's fine. But also ask your patient, like, which finger do you want me to use do you have a specific area? Because I mean, honestly, if this is my finger, I don't want someone poking me right here. I feel like that would really hurt. So I kind of go on the, the middle inside. Where's the camera? Like the middle inside, like there. Um, you're going to puncture the patient's fingertip with the lancet. Okay, so here, if this is the lancet, you push it against the finger and then you're going to push the button. But the thing that I've seen with nursing students is that you want to, you don't want to hurt the patient. So you don't want to poke them. So you're like gently poking them. But if you gently poking them, you won't actually puncture the skin deep enough to be able to produce the drop of blood. So, I mean, you know, don't be super rough, but put some pressure on that finger so that you can actually puncture the finger and get your blood sample. Obtain a drop of blood per manufacturer's orders. Wipe away the first drop of blood. 
squeeze it again a little bit so that you can get the new fresh blood that hasn't been contaminated with coming through the skin and the alcohol and all of that. Um, so cover the puncture site with a clean, dry material. Usually you can just use a cotton ball and ask the patient to pinch it um, and it'll stop bleeding on its own because it's just a teeny, teeny puncture. And dispose of the soiled equipment. The lanchette set needs to go into the sharps container, which is in the room. And then the meters in the hospital, when docked on their charging station, will put that number, the blood sugar number, in to the computer. And I'm just going to kind of leave that at that because um, there's different protocols that the hospitals want you to do. And so we'll talk more about that when we go to clinical because every facility is different. So I don't want to give one group different information than my group. Okay. 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 So let's check my blood sugar. What time is it? It is 10, 15. So, um, so we'll see what my blood sugar is. And I bet you it's just, you know, annoying and high. So first I have my alcohol wipe and I am going to wipe off the surface. So when you wipe off the surface, you want to give it a good 30 second scrub here. And then you have to let it dry. <laughs> Nursing students do not blow on the, uh, wet alcohol site to dry it because what are you doing? You're putting germs all over it. You can maybe do this if you're in a hurry or you can do this as the first step and then wait to, uh, you know, and they get your, your supplies ready while the alcohol is drying on the finger. Okay, so then you're gonna get your test strip. And I don't wanna show you too much about my meter because it's not gonna be the same as the hospital. I have like a private one that, you know, my doctor prescribed to me, but you'll put the strip into the meter. And then usually putting the strip in will turn the meter on. And so now you're ready to go. It says apply blood, which the meters in the hospital will say that too. And then we're going to poke me. Okay, let's poke. So I'm putting enough pressure on that. I'm going to actually puncture the skin. Did I get it? Didn't even feel like it. Ooh. Well, that's because I have like really good lancets. Okay. But here I'm squeezing. If you pass out from the side of blood, don't look. I'm squeezing. You don't really want to milk the finger, but I'm cold and I'm in my office, so it's not good. So then I'm going to wipe that first drop of blood off with the alcohol wipe or a cotton ball. And I'm going to squeeze it again and see it comes back. So now I have my drop of blood. You want to put the meter to the blood, not the blood to the meter, so that you can kind of suck it up like a straw. Okay, and then it counts down. Oh, I'm, you're going to see it before I see it. Ooh, what was that, 145? 145. And then my meter's like, oh, this is above average range. Oh, well, yes, it is. I will walk around the block. Uh, okay. So then I would take my meter out with my gloved hand and I would put the meter or the, all of the trash into the trash can, but the lancet goes into the sharps container. Um, some good tips on how to get your patient's blood to actually give you a good drop is to have their arm hanging dependent. And if they're really, really, really um, have a lot of calluses or poor peripheral circulation, you can um, sometimes use like a warm towel and wrap it around their hand for a few minutes before you go in to check their blood sugar. Because our patients, uh, if they regularly check their blood sugar, their fingers will be very, very calloused. Okay, so that is how you check a blood sugar. We will do way more training on this when we get to the hospital and in class we'll practice it, but I just wanted to introduce you to that kind of concept. Um, Okay, well then, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought. I feel like it's a 10-hour video, but we'll see. Okay, bye.